This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitt. Carlos Reyes wrote the game Rent Wars for the Atari 8-Bit Computers for First Star Software, a game that was never officially released but found its way out into the internet years later. He also wrote Quick Menu, a 384-byte program that would display a menu of programs on a floppy disk and let the user choose one to run. The program was designed to fit on a floppy's three boot sectors so it didn't eat into any of the usable space on the disk. The program was a popular interface to distribute disks of pirated programs, but most people didn't know that Carlos was the author because there was no room for his name in the tiny program. Carlos has found the source code to Quick Menu and released it into the public domain. There's a link to that in the show notes. This interview took place on August 3rd, 2018. In it, we discussed Jerry White, Fernando Herrera, and Bill Wilkinson, all of whom I have previously interviewed. I, I was born in Puerto Rico. My family moved to the United States, I think it was around 1978, uh, New York City. Uh, I remember I came uh, for the uh, seventh grade in school. And my starting computers was freshman year of high school. And I had a sister that was attending the, uh, the high school. And she had taken a, a class, I think it was programming uh, mainframe computers. And she, she knew I liked technology, you know, electronics. She, and she was like, oh, you know, you really should take it. So I, I started high school. I, um, I signed up for the class as a freshman. And as soon as I signed up, they said no. This is no longer mainframes. It's actually now personal computers. And this is uh, the fall of 1980. I was a freshman in high school. And um, I just loved, I, you know, just from the beginning, I just loved computers. Uh, the next year, which is the, you know, so that was my, my local public high school, John Bound High School in Flushing, Queens. Then I applied to attend Stuyvesant High School, which is a specialized science high school, and I was accepted. So in the fall of 19, oh, well, I need to backtrack a little bit because I had a, I right away, I loved computers. So I know it was around that time in the fall of 1980 that I had an older brother and he bought an Atari 400 for me, which I'm still extremely grateful. You know, I, I, I didn't have any money at the time, of course. Uh, so then I applied to Stuyvesant in the fall of 81. I, I was attending, uh, I was a sophomore in high school. And that's when I met um, Kari Paley. Uh, he was also a sophomore. And the, the, the key is that he lived in Long Island, but he was working at a computer store. And that's really what opened up the door for me. I, I think if I hadn't met Kari, I probably would have just on my own, just fooled around with computers. But he knew Jerry White. And and from that, you know, one thing led to another. I was rather, I mean, the first thing I did when I got the computer, um, I couldn't afford to buy an assembler. So I actually, the, the, my very first program, uh, first non-trivial program on any computer ever was actually to write an assembler wow. in Atari Basic. Holy cow. This is like 1980 and it worked. Of course, you know, very slow and not a ton of features, but it worked. And I was writing assembly programs for fun. I remember I had written a, a flood fill algorithm, which I think I gave to my friend Kari, and I think he showed to Fernando Herrera, or maybe he showed it to Jerry, who showed it to Fernando. So as a result of that, I, I, I maybe, you know, I'm covering a lot of ground relatively quickly here, but as a result of that, I got a call from Fernando um, and, you know, things just kind of snowballed from there. Nice. Wow. So did you, were you doing everything on the Atari 400 the, the, the whole time? Yeah, that's all I had. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, Atari 400, I had a cassette reader for the, for the data. I had a 300 baud modem. I think it was Hayes. That's what everybody had. And I think I had, oh my God, it was an Epson MX80, that matrix printer, you know, eight or nine, nine pins, um, which, which was a lot uh, considering. 
but yeah, that's that's what I had, and it was basically just me. You know, my friend Kari, you know, he worked at the computer store, but he was never really into programming. He, he was more into the scene. You know, he loved the games. So we were playing a lot of games at the time. Um, but it was really it was really just me on my own. I just loved it, and I was teaching myself everything. Nice. So, all right, so tell me about, uh, were, you, were you hanging out with, uh, with Fernando Herrera and, and Jerry White, or was, it, was your relationship mostly you know, online or on the phone, or, or how did that work? Well, I, I mean, you, you know, putting it into context, I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, Fernando, he was a family man. You know, he, he had, of course, you know, he wrote my first alphabet for his son, Steve. Um, and so was Jerry White, you know, they were, you know, I don't know, I, I don't think middle age is the right term, but, you know, they may have been in their 30s. I, I, I don't really know. And I, ha- and I have been in the U.S. for a total of, you know, maybe three years. And, you know, this is me, what, you know, 40 years later, and I still have an accent. So you can just imagine my accent was really, really thick <laughs> at the time. <laughs> So I give them credit for just being able to understand me when I try to to speak in English. But anyway, so I got the phone call from Fernando, and he invited me over to his house. I remember he lived in a huge, you know, apartment building in in the Bronx, and and that's when I met, you know, his son Steve, and he was showing me, you know, my first alphabet, and he was talking. He he had already done Astro Chase, so he was telling me about that and the process. But, but the whole point of that conversation was that they were interested in me writing a game for First Star. And, you know, I, I was in a very different mindset than, than Fernando and Jerry were because I was just a kid. You know, I, 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 I wasn't in it. For, I didn't need to make money. You know, I, I really literally was just for the fun of it. I just love computers. I love programming. And it was like, sure, you know, why not? You know, I love sure. programming. Um, there was never, I mean, I know there was a discussion of money that was supposed to be like 5% royalty, you know, from the game, but I had an Atari 400. So they first started gave me an Atari 800, excuse me, which I then kept, you know, that, and that ended up being the only payment I ever got from first star because the game was never released. Um, and, and so, so I, I started working on the game for First Star, and, you know, that took a while. You know, I was, I was in school. And at some point along the line, my friend Kari put me in touch with Jerry. Um, don't remember the exact details. But Jerry, you know, he was, he was mostly an Atari basic programmer. Extremely hardworking. Uh, I just listened to his back, to his the interview that you did with him, and, and yeah, very interesting. But he he wasn't an assembly programmer. If he did assembly, he did he, he wasn't didn't do much with it. So I I, I know I did some stuff for for Jerry. Um, I think I sent you the link, you know, for that article. This is somebody had put in a request for being able to do a custom cursor, which needed to be done in assembly. So I wrote the assembly, and that's how I got my name in in Antic Magazine. And I know I did a couple other things for him. I remember at least one time, you know, he called me up and he was, uh, somebody somebody had said, um, you know, is it possible to keep an Atari computer from resetting? And he called me up. He said, you know, is, is it possible? You know, somebody was claiming that they could do that. And there was a way, you know, you could poke a memory location and if you're in a tight loop, you kept the, the reset signal from being interpreted, but it only worked for it. You know, if you, if you hit, hit the key a lot after a couple of seconds, you could get it to reset. Um, but definitely you couldn't do anything else while, while that was happening. So, so I remember he, he calling me up and asking me about that. I wrote that assembly code. I think I did a couple other small things. And what I, what I do remember with Jerry, because we had never talked money. That was very secondary for me. I remember one time, you know, because he also lived in, in Long Island. He was driving me back to the train station. I was, you know, still living in Queens. And he had written a book on origami. So he gave me 
a ring made out of a hundred dollar bill that you know he had published the pattern in his book and i think that was the only payment i ever got from him hmm. and that was fine i you know i i that was not you know i was just enjoying what i was doing nice so all right so the game that you wrote for first star that was n not published at least not immediately was called rent wars um tell me about the where the idea came from and how you went about creating it okay this is their idea and you know it's something that i think i have some regrets on you know maybe not being you know more outspoken on on, on the details of the idea again you know i was i was just a kid yeah yeah uh, and, and but it was it was their idea i was implementing you know they their their vision for the game i think um I, I, the, the game wasn't a ton of fun, you know, I'm being, you know, blunt about it. It was relatively simple. I think if I had felt, you know, more a sense of ownership on the idea, I probably would have done quite a bit more to make it more interesting. Um, they had basically, you know, first star, I think had gotten started for, with Astro Chase and then Richard, Richard Spitalny came along, you know, he, he was the president. Uh, I've learned recently actually that he was part owner. I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. And they had, they brought in uh, about half a dozen people to write games. And they were all kind of like me, you know, they were not salaried, you know, the, the idea was you write the game for us and then we publish it, you get a royalty. And the truth is, I, I think the ones that were, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel like I was a more of an in-house project. I, I think those were less successful. The ones that, that did better for them, you know, I'm, and I'm thinking like Flip Flop and Boulder Dash, they were really external projects. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually met the guy that did Flip Flop that, that was in development while I was there. You know, we'll go on once in a while and visit the office in, in Manhattan. And he had just gotten out of the army. He was a young man. And I think he wrote the game while he was in the army. Hmm. Uh, and he just approached First Star to publish it. And I know, and I know Boulder Dash was basically, uh, and also Spy vs. Spy. I mean, they were basically done when they approached First Star as, as a publisher. So there were, there were some other games that were being done in house. I, if I had to guess, maybe half never got published. And, and the ones that got published, you know, they were not, and, and I know at least one of them was for Commodore 64, so they were not just doing Atari. But I don't think any of the any of the in-house projects other than Fernando's, uh, he was working on Bristles at the time. Um, I don't think any of them were, were a big success. So your game was, uh, not actually released. It sounds like it was, you finished it more or less. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I did everything they asked me to do mm -hmm. and, you know, I think they could see that it wasn't, you know, the most engaging game. So I remember they asked me to make some changes. Um, and you know, I don't think the changes really improved the game. And, and thankfully, the uh, the version that that's out in the wild now uh, does did not include those changes. So, so the version that I, that's that you can find out there that they released, you know, I don't know, twenty five years later, uh, was the one that, you know, I I consider the final version. And, you know, again, this is, nineteen eighty three, roughly, you know, towards the end of nineteen eighty three. And the the whole game industry, it, it ha, well, it had changed. You know, I think the, the I think the IBM PC, you know, was was beginning to make inroads. There was already talk of the you know things like the Atari ST, you know, the sixteen thirty two bit systems, and you know they they just felt that given the amount of investment that they would have to put in to release it, you know, with advertising and everything else, it probably, it probably wouldn't do great. And, and, you know, 
again, I was just a kid. You know, yeah. I, I was disappointed, but I was like, okay, you know, that's fine. I'm off to college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that's essentially what happened. All right. I'd like to talk about the other program that you wrote that probably every pirate used and nobody nobody knew you and or I don't think anybody knew you wrote this thing right <laughs> yeah. right uh, let's uh tell me the the story of uh, of quick menu well I, I i something i need to say because i remember you know this is kind of a a segue i remember i was in the first star office one day and they had i think they were about to release, oh no, they were, I think they were just releasing Flip Flop. So they booted it up, you know, they wanted me to see it, maybe there may have been somebody else there. And, you know, as the game is, is booting up, you know, they, they turned to me and they said, <laughs> I, I mean, looking back, it's, I think it's pretty funny, but, you know, they, they were 100% serious, you know, they, they turned to me and they said, you know, please, please, um, Please don't don't release release this as a bootleg right away. Can you please wait a little while? <laughs> <laughs> but but the truth is, I never. I, I was. I, I'll admit I was a consumer, but I was never ever a producer of illegal software, just because I was too busy, and there were so many other people doing it. It was like there was no need for me to do it. You know, the, the, I, I didn't find that interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I can honestly say, I never, I was never a pirate from the point of view of, you know, buying something or, or getting, or getting a copy of something and cracking it, you know, removing copy protection and releasing. I never did that. There were so many other people doing it. There was, I, I mean, it was like, what's the point? So anyway, um, I don't. I don't know where the idea for the quick menu came from. Well, I think. I, well, I guess. I guess it must have come because there were other programs out there that that were doing a similar function. You know, that you will install them on the on the floppy. You will turn on the computer, and they will run, and you will see a menu, and you will pick, and you will run. And and just for for context, I mean, typically this would be a a list of of. Of, ob of machine language programs that you could run from a menu. And it was probably a, a four or five pirated games that someone had shoved onto the disk. And it was just a quick and easy way to uh, start running running your game, right? Right. Because games, uh, especially at the time, they were pretty self-contained. Um, you know, if you wanted to run an application program, you probably needed to have the the disk operating system, you know, the DAS, and, and that was a large application that you would load from Flappy first and then launch your program. But games, I don't think, you know, basically there was like no game that needed that. Um, you know, there, there were some basic built-in functions, you know, a BIOS built into the computer, so some real, you know, rudimentary stuff. But even even that, you know, once the game started running, you basically didn't use any of that. So, yeah, so games, you know, if you if it's something that needed any kind of performance, it was written in, in assembly. Uh, again, you know, Jerry White, he I know he wrote a lot, most of his stuff in Atari Basic. Um, but and and yeah, you know, I I I. I've, vividly remember, you know, Poker Sam and a lot of the other things that he did and, and that was Atari basic. But so 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 people will will copy these games and you know I think the floppies were like 96k that they could hold, but the computers came with 16 and the most they could handle was like 48. So you could probably stuff, yeah, like you said, you know, half a dozen games easily onto a floppy. And yeah, you kind of needed something, you know, to to quickly launch it. And uh, yeah, so I think I know I, I know it wasn't the first one to do something like this. There were already some programs out there, but they were not very good. And and what I remember seeing is that because the the floppies, and it's not all that different even today with with a hard disk or a, or a flash drive that you put up into. They had a. a a, a set of sectors set aside at the very beginning of the floppy and 
when you put it in and you turn on the computer, the computer knew to just load, read those sectors, and then just jump into the beginning of that data, okay? And with Atari, it was three sectors. Each one was 128 bytes. So you had 384 bytes set aside, you know, reserved at the beginning of every floppy for this boot. And normally what that will do is I just, just turn around you know, I believe there were, there were some BIOS routines for reading data from, from Flappy. So we just turn around and read read a file from the Flappy and then jump into that, and that was the real program. And all of the menus that were around at the time were like that. You know, they will have a, a bootloader, but the real menu was really a, a, yet another program that you had to copy onto the Flappy that was chain loaded. And I was like, you know, for a while I was like, you know, that's kind of awkward. And then it's like, hmm, you know, maybe I can do better. Maybe I, I mean, I, I, I didn't think at first I, I could actually get the whole thing to fit into the sectors. But as I started working on it, it was like, hmm, you know, I, I think I can get this to fit. And and, and I, I give I give my friend Carrie a, a lot of credit because, you know, again, he was not he was not much of a computer programmer. He definitely didn't know assembly, but. He um he was a huge fan. He was like, "Wow, yeah, you know, you can do this." <laughs> so, um, I spent many, many, many hours. There were many revisions. Uh, of course, uh, several of them, you know, were over 384 bytes. You know, so it was a real struggle. Uh, I remember, I remember thinking, gee, you know, it would be nice to at least, you know, put my initials in here somewhere. You know, you know, maybe I will have a couple of bytes at the end left over, but I, I, could, I couldn't manage that. I mean, it, it was a real struggle. I remember one time, you know, the, pro, the program was just too big, and I studied it, I studied it. I mean, I, I, I spent a long time just going through the code, and as it's still true today, you know, the, the 6502 had a carry bit, you know, when you're doing uh, arithmetic. Sure. And, and, I, and, and I know there was inst an instruction CLC, which is clear carry. And I had, I had studied the code and, you know, I saw every place that I could get to, to that piece of code. And that CLC, which was one, just one byte, I didn't need it. And to me, that was like, you know, a major win, you know, I, I, all of a sudden I had one extra bite. And of course, you know, the, uh, the joke with us is that my friend was also called, you know, Kari, C-A-R-Y though, not with only one R. But I remember that was like a big event. I was able to save a bite and, and get it to fit because real struggle. And, and, and then of course, over time, I found ways to make parts of it shorter. So I remember at one point, and it's got to be in the final version. I added a, um, I, I don't know what the right term, you know, a burst loader so that, that will actually load a bunch of the data at once as opposed to trying to do it, you know, smaller chunks. And, you know, so the whole thing improved over time. Um, but yeah, the, the big problem with it is that nobody knew that it, it was me because I would release it, you know, it had no, no documentation. I think people, I think probably people figured out that I think if you hit reset, it will, you know, you could put in a new floppy, hit reset, and get a new listing. I assume people figured that out. But but the, the one part that was also another breakthrough is I think you could hit, I guess it was the escape key, hit the escape key, and it will clone itself onto the floppy that was in the drive. And I'm sure a lot of people, you know, will hit the escape key and they will get a scare. Of like, you know, is this erasing the whole floppy? <laughs> Because there was no documentation, mm -hmm. but but I just told I just told you all the features. You know, you hit reset, re reread the floppy, hit escape, clone, and then otherwise just pick from the menu and it will just launch the program. You know, in three three hundred and eighty four bytes, that's all I could fit in there. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, things have changed a lot since then. <laughs> So you recently sent me the source code, which I have uh, put online, and, and there'll be a link to that with this interview. Um, did why did you still have it? You still have your Atari, and and uh, and just tell me the story about how this this survived. I I haven't had my Atari computer for 
many, many, many years. I, I don't even remember what happened to it. Um, I remember for a long time, I, I kept a printout of, of print wars. And, you know, I estimate it was 50,000 lines just based on the thickness of the printout. You know, I don't know, it was like three or four inches high and, you know, 60 or 66 lines per page. That was the math that I did. Yeah, yeah. But, but I don't have that. I don't have that anymore. You know, I was, I felt a little guilty. You know, I don't own the rights to this. I can't really, I don't feel comfortable giving it to anybody else. So there was a move at one point that I just didn't keep that. So I think the, pretty much the only thing I still have for Atari is the, um, those printouts. And for some reason, I have a copy of, like that could pull it out, it, it, like the Atari memory map. You know, it was a relatively thin book. Mm -hmm. And I, I kept them all together. And, you know, they're in a filing cabinet. And that's like, I, I mean, it's something that was a big deal to me. I spent many hours on that. But also I knew that nobody else had this. And I'm sure, a lot, you know, like like you're saying, but there are a lot of people that are probably curious. You know, they didn't know who had written this program. So, I, just, I mean, I kept it. It wasn't a big deal. Nice. What do you do today? <laughs> well, I'm I'm still a computer programmer, um, and um, I guess I was working from home. You know, I I'm, I'm in the mountain time zone, and I get up at 5 a.m. So I I did actually um, at least a couple hours of work early on, and um, I listened to uh, Jerry's podcast. Hmm. Jerry's interview. Which, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I I enjoyed that. Yeah. I also interviewed uh, Fernando. That one's a little harder to find, but uh, it's out there. Yes. No, I, I found it, and at least into the beginning, I, I, I've had a busy week. I, I, didn't, I didn't know. You know, it was actually a friend, another friend from high school that found me. You know, I, 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 I consider it a real achievement for somebody to find me because my name is very common. Mm -hmm. And I moved, I moved halfway across the country. And once in a long while, you know, I get an email. Oh, are you Carlos? That used to be, you know, so and so. <laughs> so this friend f managed to find me, and he's been listening to some of your podcasts. And he's like, "Oh, you know, did you know about this?" Um, you know, and he knew that I had worked with Jerry White. So anyway, so that 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 happened literally like two weeks ago. Nice. And who was this friend? Uh, his name is Sander Antoniadis, huh. and he was not, he really wasn't too much into computers at the time, uh -huh. even though now uh, he's uh, working in, in IT also. Nice. All right, so um, what haven't we discussed about the Atari years that, that we should have? Were there any other, any other projects that you worked on but didn't publish or any other, I don't know, just anything else? Okay. Well, w one other thing that, that happened, and I almost forgot about it. Um, I think I think Jerry, in his interview, he mentioned that Bill Wilkinson passed away recently. Yes. And I actually met uh, Bill. Uh, I believe it was spring break 1985, and I was a freshman in college. I attended Columbia University, and I had a requirement for you know, work study, you know, I had to work during the summer. And I'm like, gee, you know, maybe I can get a work, you know, get a job working for somebody in, in the computer, you know, Atari industry. I had a sister that had just moved to Mountain View, California. And I, I, I asked her, you know, can I go there for, for a few days? And I had contacted Bill. So I went and visited, you know, Optimize Systems. And it was, a, you know, one of those things that you never forget, you know, I, I went there. I don't know what time. I guess it must have been around lunchtime because I'm. I was there waiting. When I see Bill, you know, walking the door, you know, it, I, it was somewhat heavy set and you know, head full of blonde hair, walking very quickly, and there were like at least half a dozen guys trying to keep up with him. <laughs> and there must have been other employees, but you know, they just burst through the door very quickly, and. You know, introduced myself, told him, you know, I I actually um, 
what we talked about was actually having a library of functions to go along with Mac 65. Mm -hmm. I had, I think I had used Mac 65 to write my game, and it was it was still I mean it was it was a great assembler, and I had I, I guess I had done some some stuff already along those lines. You know I I, I don't really remember, but. I I had a, I had you know I, I couldn't afford to to work for free, still, you know I was in college and I had a requirement I needed to, uh, I think it was like two thousand dollars that Col you know Colombia being expensive that it was that I needed to earn during the summer, and it, and it was clear that that was that was more money than than he really could, could afford at the time you know it was already in the decline of of the eight bit world, so so. That was it, you know. I, I I got to meet him. It was fascinating, but I, I never saw him again. Um, I um, I th I think that's. Let me look. At, let me look at my notes. Oh well, yeah. There, there's one other thing I wanted to mention mm -hmm. because I was at. You know, I, I was attending. You know, high school. Stuyvesant and high school is in Manhattan. And first our software was somewhere around Midtown. So it was pretty easy for me to stop by there on the way home after school. So I know I, I stopped by, you know, once in a while. So I remember there was another time I was there and they had a beta of Bristles. And that was the project that Fernanda was working on during this time frame. And they were they were, you know, and I know Richard was there, they were Two other gentlemen, I don't remember their names, but they were looking at his game, and it was really, really, really buggy. <laughs> I mean, they were trying to play it, and he was doing, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. You know, I, I don't know if you even remember bristles, but you know, you're a painter and you have a brush and you're trying to color the, the levels, and you know, the the brush <laughs> the brush was like you don't have enough paint. So the paint will skip <laughs> as, it, as it went across the, to the level. And I think they will give it the input to go one way and he will go the other way. And I mean, it was just really buggy. But I remember, you know, the time that I had visited uh, Fernando, you know, he, he made a big point of telling me, you know, it's OK. It's OK for software to be buggy as long as you have a, a good idea, you know, where the bugs are coming from. You know, and, and this is something that a comment that he had made to me, and and this is, you know, he was he was living that that philosophy, um, and I, I'll give him a lot of credit because by the time it was released, there was there, there were no bugs left, and and Astro Chase, you know, was also very clean, so, you know, it even to me, you know, even to me at the time, it felt a little bit odd. You know, you don't, you don't really suffer, you know, that's so buggy, you can barely play it. But you know, maybe it worked for him. Um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the way I was doing things. And I don't think it's the way that I, hopefully, I don't think it's the way I've done things since then. But that was really interesting. You know, that, that's, that's another thing that I remember. Boy, God, you know, it was so, <laughs> so full of bugs, you know, but hey, it worked for him. And and I, and I and the other thing I remember is visiting. I visited Jerry White in Long Island. Oh, I don't know, maybe three or four times. And and I really liked Jerry. You know, he was very, very um, matter of fact. You know, very straightforward. You know, he was. You could just talk to him and just tell him, and he will ask. You know, very no. There was no fooling around. You know, I think I think I, I always felt that Fernando was much more marketing oriented. You know, he would spend a lot of time, you know, just talking about things. And he, I mean, when I visited him, he told me the whole story of my first alphabet, and mm -hmm. of course, his son Steve was right there. Mm -hmm. So, so that was that was very interesting. But Jay had it, to, you know, totally opposite. He was just very matter of fact. You know, this is this is what I need. You know, and and. Polar opposite. So, so I was a little surprised um, listening to Jerry's interview. Is is I, I didn't know this at the time, but it sounds like they were good friends at the time. Um, I you know I knew they must have known each other. I didn't realize that they they were 
you know, they, they really enjoyed each other's company. I, because to me, the, the personalities were so different. Um, um, so. If you could send a message to the Atari community that still exists, and, <laughs> and you can right now, what would you tell them? Well, you know, things have changed so much. I, I have spent time in, in the last year learning um, x86 assembly, you know, 64-bit. It is so different. It is so different. You know, it, it was it was such a joy at the time. You know, I I knew. You know, the the CPU was tied to the the clock cycle of the of the TV screen. You know, you knew that. I think the width of one character, I think, was like two cycles. And they were like in lockstep. It is so different now. You know, you write assembly nowadays. And in fact, something that I've said before is that I, I, I mostly write in C++. So I, I think it's accurate to say that C++ is as far away from assembly as assembly is from what the computer actually runs. And it didn't used to be like that. I mean, you could write assembly and you, you could count pretty much every cycle, of course, you had the display list interrupts, but even those you could predict. You know, you knew at the end of every scan line, you're gonna get interrupted and, you know, you, there's gonna be a few cycles stolen and you had the the um, the, the vertical blank at the end of the frame and you, you knew you had so many cycles and you could often count down, you know, almost to the cycle. And that, and that was, I, and, and you could, you knew, you know, you could learn and, and know all of the assembly language instructions. Nowadays, even doing that is a huge challenge. You know, you have the SIMD, you know, single instruction, multiple data, and those just go on and on. And I mean, it, it's, it's orders of magnitude more complex than, than it used to be. So there was a real joy in, you know, the feeling of, of, you know, being able to, to, to say to yourself, I know this computer so well, I know exactly where all these cycles are going, I know exactly, you know, what it's doing. And, you know, again, an assembly nowadays really feels more like a, almost feels more like a high level language, really, because there's so much translation that goes on. Um, and, and of course, computers were so new at the time, people just didn't, um, you know, it was it was just the wonder of it, you know, and, and that that's what attracted me to it. And, 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 you know, still, you know, just the fact that you can tell a machine to do something and it'll, it'll do it. And, you know, the sense of creation, I still have, um, I still, I'm still drawn to that. And I still enjoy that. And it was, you know, it, I'm sure it's a cliche, but, you know, it's a, I feel it was a magical time because things were so simple and, you got, you know, I got to know either directly or indirectly. Um, you know, the, the three names that I got to know first, and they probably knew everybody in the industry. And, you know, I remember hearing some stories about, you know, Ross Wedmore that was behind Preppy. Uh, I think he was a good friend of Jerry. And of course, you know, Fernando Herrera knew, knew many other people. And, and now the industry is so humongous and Oh, and of course, things are you know changing so quickly. Um, so I, I think I think somebody that's that's coming into of age now, I think will have a hard time understanding how how different things were then. Um, but I loved every minute of it. I like I said, I went off to college and got an Atari ST and just kept on going from there. Um, and I, I, I loved, I loved everything I did with the Atari. I'm, I'm, I was shocked to see that somebody doing a podcast now. I, I think it's great. Um, there's so many memories and so many people. You're up to what is it? 350 podcasts. Something like I mean, that. It's just, yeah. It, it's just crazy. And I, I've listened to one of them, Jerry's, and it was so full of information and stories. I mean, my God. I, I saw that Jerry gave his contact information at the end of the his podcast. I'm I'm happy to do so also. Okay, go ahead. If you just want to uh, say it. So, so my cell number is five zero five, which is I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So it's five zero five two zero six 
1569. And my email is C R E Y E S digits one two three at yahoo.com. All right. Thank you so much, Carlos. This was great. But thank you. This is fun. <laughs>